Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to MitoAction's monthly expert series. My name is Kyra Mann, CEO of MitoAction, and we are honored that you took the time out of your day to be here with us. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the MitoAction website in the coming days, as well as on our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. If you're joining us via phone, I would encourage you to follow along with the presentation slides that can be found on the MitoAction website at www.mitoaction.org slash resources slash diagnostics. If you are joining us via your computer, you should see the presentation on your screen. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar. If you are calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org, and we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can at the end of today's presentation. The diagnostic journey, as we all know, is one of the most difficult and frustrating elements of having a rare disease. We are so grateful for the companies and individuals who tirelessly work to improve genetic testing to provide our families the answer they so desperately need. Today, we're excited to have two of those individuals here with us to share what is current coming up and on the horizon for genetic testing. Christine Stanley is the Chief Director of Clinical Genomics at Variantix. She is particularly familiar with the complexities of interpretation of genetic data for patients with rare inherited disorders, given the many cases she has worked on over the years, first at Athena Diagnostics and later at Cortigen Life Sciences. Christine brings that experience to Variantix where she now oversees clinical genomic interpretations for the laboratory, developing the standards for identifying and reporting relevant casual variants. Christine holds a PhD in human genetics from the Medical College of Virginia with fellowship training at Boston University in clinical molecular genetics. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics and a fellow of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. She additionally maintains a part-time appointment as clinical laboratory director of C2I Genomics. David Keen has been involved with neurogenetics since 1998 when he started working for Athena Diagnostics. He has attended over 50 mitochondrial disease grand rounds pre presentations by leading experts in mitochondrial disease. In 2011, David joined, the, joined GeneDX where he helped build the neurogenetics team as a senior genetic testing consultant specializing in neurology, and mitochondrial genetics. Most recently, David joined Variantix, where he serves as director for rare disorders. Please join me in welcoming Christine and David. Okay, thank you. Um, so the talk today is entitled Whole Genome Sequencing for Rare Disorders, The Future is Here. Um, we went, uh, probably don't need to go through my background. Thank you for the really nice introduction. Um, I will just say that uh, regarding the background is that I've been in this um, area for about 15 years working in clinical diagnostic testing using multiple platform genetic tests and next-gen sequencing tests. And um, this is important for the presentation because I've seen firsthand how disjointed testing can delay the time to diagnosis for patients. And so that's kind of the mindset that I come into when I, when I present to you about how Variantix really uh, revolutionizes that genetic testing process and combining all these different types of method platform tests into one single test. As far as disclosures go, that was already mentioned that I do um, work for uh, diagnostic laboratories um, and my presentation will be on um, the testing that's done at Variantix. So the overview here um, is just uh, two main points really. Um, the first one is that uh, genomes provide a data structure or platform to enable very comprehensive testing, which allows us to detect the cause of disease that's often missed by other tests. And also the second point is that Variantix unifies what's being currently tested on multiple different genetic 
tests or platforms that can be at different laboratories. Um, and so when you get results that are from different laboratories on different tests, um, there's no way to really unify that. The ordering clinician has to be able to look at those different results and try to put it into a single result report. And what Variantix is doing is doing that for you, doing all the testing that's necessary to make the diagnosis. Um, so then I'll show you how this test actually works to diagnose patients, focusing on those patients with clinical symptoms that are associated with mitochondrial disease. So um, I'll begin with reviewing how the test provides the data platform or data structure to allow for the identification of different variants that cause disease in patients. Um, so we start with um, the, at the beginning, right? Um, would just wanna review what genetic testing is um, and how it starts. So all genetic testing um, requires a DNA sample. So it will take either a blood sample or a saliva sample and the laboratory will extract the DNA out of that sample. So that's where, how all of these tests begin. And then most of the tests will then fragment the DNA, break it up into pieces. And then after that, we see differences in how testing is done. So I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time um, discussing the differences between the main types of genetic tests that are in the industry today. So once you have those pieces of DNA and we're kind of using the analogy here of these Lego blocks of different colors, um, to try to demonstrate, to try to like show you how these tests are different from one another. So when we're looking at the typical exome test or gene panel test, we're really only looking at a subset of the, the DNA that was originally fragmented. So what I want you to think about when you think of each one of these bricks is that um, these may be like the coding pieces on the left hand side here where we're looking at the um, the actual coding pieces and that genomes has everything coding pieces non coding pieces all kinds of stuff and what are coding pieces what are we talking about um, exomes are tests that look at the exons and they're the parts of the instructions of our DNA that actually make the proteins um, enzymes and things that the cells in your body use for everyday functions for growth and maintenance. Um, and for exome testing, there's this step that starts right at the beginning where it, the, the testing process fishes out the exon pieces or those coding pieces for those proteins in your body. It's looking for the um, DNA that describes how to make those pieces. And so to do that, um, that's like a mechanical step. You're gonna fish through all of this broken pieces of DNA and you're gonna pull out the stuff that you wanna look at. So important thing to note here is that first of all, when you pull out what you wanna look, you throw away what's left over. That just washes away and you keep the stuff you're interested in. Secondly, whenever you try to take you know, 10 greens, 10 blues, 10 reds, 10 yellows, you're never gonna get exactly 10. So what it also does at the very beginning is skews the data. And that's really important for some of the things that we will try to identify um, on these sequencing tests that are actually not typically performed by sequencing tests. So the reason that this has been done in the past where you would just look at like a proportion of the total is that, um, the coding pieces, the exonic pieces of your DNA really are only about 2% of your total DNA. Um, and so that's a very small amount. And the cost to actually sequence or read those pieces is really expensive. So the, the easiest thing to do is just focus in on the, the stuff that actually makes the proteins, throw away the rest of it and only sequence that. And even that is a lot of data. So labs, because of costs and because of efficiency of testing and all, have decided to just pull out what they want and discard the rest, which is fine when you're just looking for changes in the AGTC letters that make up the, the, um, uh, the code, the genetic code that's coding for all these proteins and things. The problem with that is if you try to extrapolate anything else from the data set, it becomes challenging because the data is not 
the same. It's not consistent. It's not uniform. You took more of some things and less of other things. And I'll be able to show you a little bit more um, in, a, in a couple of slides. So let's go to the next one. Um, so again, this is just kind of reiterating that um, once you throw away the stuff that you don't want to use, it's gone. You can't get it back. Um, genomes has the most data, then exomes, then gene panels, single gene tests, multi-gene tests. Those are going to be the smallest amount of data on the bottom. The reason the data structure is important is because of what we do, not just to identify the sequence changes, but to try to identify other changes. So here's what the actual data looks like. It looks really complicated if you look at it at first, but I'll just point out the important features to note when you're looking at this data that sort of underscores the differences between exomes, panel type sequence tests, and genomes. So what you look on the right is the data that we see from a genome. And when you look on the left, this is the data that we see we see from exomes. We run both of those types of tests at our lab, but we primarily focus on the genome because of what I'll present in this presentation today. For just scale, we picked a random gene, this ABCA4 gene, and you can see on the bottom, we're zooming in on the exome data and on the genome data at the same gene from the same patient. What you can see here for the, the gene here, and you know it's not terribly important what the gene's called or anything, but you can see these little blue boxes at the bottom. The little blue boxes are like those little Lego pieces. Those are the coding sequences of a gene. And when you're doing exome sequencing, your focus, you pull, only pulled out of the pile those pieces. So this data here, these gray um, bands that are underneath the, these little peaks here, um, these little curves here, you can see are like, this is the sequencing reads that sort of we call piling up underneath. So this is just the top will be like the reference chromosome where we're aligning to. And we're trying to see if the patient sequence matches what we have as what our reference or normal sequence is. And a couple of things to take note here, see the white in between, uh, that's because we didn't capture that. We purposefully didn't take out the pieces that aren't coding sequences. So anything that's not a blue box down here, we didn't want, we like threw it away. And then the blue boxes we did sequence and the peaks of these, um, uh, these little peaks uh, above here does show us relatively how much sequencing was done in that region. So some of those boxes we had small amounts of sequencing that smaller amounts done and some we had larger amounts done and that's going to be important in, in a bit. If we look at genome, it's the same view, right? But we can see that the data is just consistent under the entire region, including the regions in between the blue boxes. Genomes don't care where the DNA is coming from, it's sequencing everything. Um, and so you don't see these gaps and you don't see as much of a difference between heights here. So differences in between the depth of sequencing or how many times this region was sequenced. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide and talk about why that's important. So the reason that that's important is that data scientists, after you know we all decided we could do identify sequence changes using this kind of next generation sequencing, data scientists were able to figure out a cool little trick of how to use this sequence information to identify different types of variants. And Variantix was one of the first laboratories to do this in a very highly sensitive way. Um, so uh, Variantix developed a tool for identifying what we call structural variants, which I'll go into in a minute, in addition to finding uh, another variant type called um, short tandem repeats. And so the reason that it was easier and better to do this off of genomes is because when you're trying to extrapolate data out of a data set, especially the type of data we're looking for, you really need uniform even coverage of all regions of the genome, even the stuff that's not coding specifically for a protein. That's how the data software tools work best. 
So up until this point, there had been no other laboratory and still no other laboratory that has a single laboratory and a single diagnostic test that can confirm the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease that are typically utilizing multiple method platforms until now. So Variantix does this with one, one sample and the one sample is going to identify all the changes that we need to look at. And what are those changes? So the changes that we're talking about are um, small sequence changes. So we talked about small sequence changes um, and those are the DNA sequences, A, T, C, G here that's demonstrated in this little icon. And so this is our four letter code. The um, A's, T's, G's, and C's, the arrangement of those provide instructions on how to make all the proteins and things that are necessary for cellular functioning and maintenance. So when we're talking about a sequencing change, we're saying the normal sequence looks like is an A, but we see in our patient it's a T. That A to T change, is that important? Will that cause a problem? And so it could be an A to T, a G to C, a G to A, whatever. We see everybody has um, many, many, many changes and most of them don't mean anything. They don't really change how that protein is being made or how it will function. But every so often a single change here will actually cause a big effect on the downstream creation of that protein, the instructions that are used to make the protein, and then you'll see disease result from it. So all of the tests that we talk about, next generation sequencing tests like exomes, panel tests, genomes, even Sanger sequencing tests, all do a pretty decent job at identifying those types of changes. So everybody's pretty much on a level playing field when we're talking about those types of changes. What we start to see is a lot of differences when we're talking about different types of changes in the human genome. And one of the biggest ones is something called structural variants. And so um, the structural variants are not looking at um, specific letter changes, but big re bigger regions of places where on the chromosome it, it, there's something missing or something added. So our um, A's, T's, G's, and C's are these sort of if we think of them as linear strands of pieces, we have 46 of them that represent our 23 chromosomes. So we have a pair of each 23. So we have 46 linear pieces of DNA that form each chromosome, but it, in reality, it's sort of uh, wound up into a, a structure that's nonlinear. In any case, we can visualize those in a microscope as being the chromosomes. You've probably seen pictures of them. And then pieces, chunks of those that might be missing or duplicated, um, those types of changes are the changes we're talking about when we talk about structural variants. And structural variants, really that data um, that you use to interpret a structural variant, the size of that variant is dependent on the coverage uniformity or the evenness of the sequencing that took place. So if your sequence wasn't very even to begin with, extrapolating out those types of changes becomes really challenging. So there's a limit to how small the change can get before your software can't really do a good job at identifying it. And so exomes can be, you can use software on exomes to try to identify those types of changes. It's just the big ones they can see, but the smaller it gets, the harder it gets for them to see it. So genomes don't have this limitation. The other kind of variant that's really important are mitochondrial variants. And these are the mitochondrial variants that are on the mitochondrial genome. Now you might think that every test will sequence this and exomes can sequence the mitochondrial genome, but not every exome test is designed to pull out the DNA for the mitochondrial genome in that first step. So if in the first step, it leaves behind the mitochondrial genome, then the mitochondrial DNA sequences won't be sequenced. And so you won't get that. So if you are getting another testing type, you wanna make sure that the mitochondrial genome is included in the test. Another type, of repeat, another type of variant is something called a tandem repeat expansion. And a tandem repeat expansion is a type of change that's a bit challenging for sequencing tests because it's the same sequence that's repeated over and over again. A lot of times these are described as trinucleotide repeat 
disorders, trinuclear tie because there are three bases in a row that get repeated, like C A G C A G C A G C A G C A G, and we have everybody has a variable copy of these repeats. Some of us might have nine, some might have twelve, some might have twenty, and all of those are in normal ranges. When you start to see diseases associated with these repeats, it's when the repeats get to be a larger size. <clears throat> and this is a limitation of other sequencing technologies. Trying to read these repetitive sequences uh, is not been, uh, di uh, uh, been um, looked at in exome and gene panel tests. These require typically other methodologies to identify them. But Variantix has utilized software tools that allow us to be able to detect the sizes, how many repeats there are in each individual. So when there's a repeat that goes outside the normal range, we're able to detect it. So to sum everything up, Variantix detects all of the relevant variant types, the small sequence changes, the structural variants, the mitochondrial variants, and tandem repeat expansions that you need to be able to, to, to identify in order to diagnose complex disease. And just another view of this is um, just a quick look at what are all the other methodologies. So right here in the bottom right panel here, we see that sequencing, um, you can do single gene sequence tests, panels of genes and sequencing tests, exome sequences, genome sequences, all of that will be used to identify um, the sequence variants. That's not the issue here. The issue is that we have to you typically use different methodologies to identify the other variant types. So you probably have heard something called chromosomal microarray, and that's something that you would use to identify these larger changes on the chromosomal level. And then another type of test, which is a smaller type of um, deletions, duplications, or additions or subtractions of genetic material, are run on something called uh, MLPA test and sometimes qPCR tests. And those will be like the exons that we talked about, those little blue boxes, if they are deleted or there's extra ones there, MLPA tests have been traditionally used or qPCR tests have been tra traditionally used to identify those changes. But that's another sample, that's another methodology. Another type of change that we talked about is the repeat expansion changes. And those are typically identified using PCR tests or Southern blot tests. And the importance of letting you know that there's all these different methodologies used is because in order to have a thorough test, most laboratories have to develop all these other types of tests. But Variantix uses genomes to be able to identify all the variant types on a single test. Okay, so part of the reason that there's a long diagnostic odyssey for patients is because of this disjointed testing in the industry. They go see the doctor, they come, they get a test done, wait for the test result to come back, it's negative, let's see what the next test is, and so on and so on and so on. And you're going to different doctors and you're getting different opinions and you're getting different test orders. And this goes on for years and years. And the, that that adds up. Each test has a cost, each test has a turnaround time, and that addition of this sequential type of testing um, causes this extended diagnostic odyssey, and not even to mention just the cumbersome nature of taking a sick child out of the house to travel to the appointment, appointments um, and to get a test and to go back and just to keep doing this over and over again without getting a result is incredibly costly, incredibly frustrating, and it definitely needs to change. Um, since we're really focusing on mitochondrial testing with this presentation, we'll just do a little quick background of why mitochondrial testing is very challenging. Mitochondria, as we all have heard, are the powerhouses of the cell. So diseases um, are, mitochondrial diseases are long-term disorders um, and they uh, occur when the mitochondria fail to produce enough energy for the functioning of the cells and organs that they're that are affected by the change. So the mitochondria create the ATP, the ATP is the energy that our body uses. 
And so what we see with disorder, mitochondrial disorders is that organs that require a large amount of energy are usually the first and most significantly affected organs. So we'll see problems with the brain, developmental delay, dementia, migraines, autistic features, seizures, strokes. Um, learning disabilities, and you can see heart issues, the heart's a muscle that requires a lot of energy, heart defects, blockage, cardiomyopathy, um, muscles require a lot of energy, so you can see poor growth, muscle weakness, muscle pain, low muscle tone, exercise intolerance, and we see issues with the lungs. Really, we see issues with every organ, but the most significant issues are with those high, um, high energy requiring organs. Other clinical symptoms associated with mitochondrial disease involve the eyes with vision loss, ptosis, optic atrophy, ophthalmoplegia, ears, hearing loss, liver, kidneys, GI disorders, swallowing, constipation, diarrhea, reflux, um, pancreatic, pancreatic issues, and then issues with all these organs can kind of circle back to cause problems throughout the body. So mitochondrial disorders involve multiple uh, body systems, and they're incredibly challenging to recognize and diagnose because they kind of masquerade as other diseases. Um, so what I'd like to do now is after having gone through the background of, you know, what this test actually can do is to show you what it actually does do in our laboratory and how it provides the answers that we, we need when we're looking at patients that have these complex disorders. So I'll go through, walk through some cases and then show you the findings that we had. Um, so this is a case of a 27-year-old female. She had a four-year diagnostic odyssey. She experienced tremors, upper extremity ataxia, abnormal gait, uh, foot dystonia, anxiety. She had lots of genetic tests that came back negative. She had Charcot-Marie tooth um, uh, tests that came back negative. She had mitochondrial analysis that came back negative. Um, she had some specific gene you know, single gene tests and, uh, uh, for nine genes that were negative. They had some variants of uncertain significance that came back, but nothing definitive. She had FMR1, SCA1, 2, 3, 6, and 7, uh, FXN for Friedrich ataxia, all came back negative. She had whole exome sequencing, only identified some variants of uncertain significance. So what we saw in, um, in this patient was, if you look over to the right here, two different variant types. One was a, one of these sequence changes and one was one of these uh, chromosomal type changes or structural variant changes. So what we saw was that uh, she had it in the um, pol r 3 a gene that is related to pol r 3 related leukodystrophy. So she had one pathogenic small sequence change and one pathogenic deletion. So we see here, this is the genome sequence results where you can see what we do for looking at deletions in the genome, there's two ways to view them when we're looking at the data. You'll see that the sequence depth was higher and then over the region it dropped because one of the chromosomes didn't contain this region. So we don't see as much sequencing here. And that's kind of one of the things the tools use to identify um, loss of, re of genetic material. Um, we had developed some visualization tools in-house that uses multiple different ways to look for these deletions, but you can kind of see here when we're looking at the mother who's the purple below and the patient who's the red, that this region is, you know, from a genome scale when you're looking at the chromosome is quite small, but it's actually a fairly sizable deletion. It's just outside the limitation of um, exome testing. So it's not really a surprise that these variants weren't picked up. And one of the other things that I didn't mention prior is that um, the, the genes that are broken up into exons or those little blue boxes, the body takes those and uh, copies the whole region. And then it takes just the, the instructions for those boxes and it cuts them and puts them together. And the process of cutting those pieces out and putting them together is called splicing. And the splicing changes that might cause a problem with putting that to, that in those instructions together in one single instruction um, is that there's some pieces in between the blue boxes that tells the body 
cut here, cut here, cut here. And so changes that are outside the boxes in the intronic regions, um, they can be actually cause disease because they can tell the, the body to not do what it was supposed to do with cutting those pieces together. And those are called intronic splice variants. And most sequencing tests will look at um, splice variants that are really close to the exons, but the further away you get from the exons, the less likely the test is going to capture that region because it's really focused on those coding sequences and it threw everything else out. So what we saw in this patient in particular is the, um, the, the variant change that we saw here is a uh, splice variant change. Um, and oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, and so we saw that that change was at plus 22 outside of that coding sequence. So that variant got missed and that variant has been very specifically associated with the distinct phenotype in the literature characterized by adolescent onset of progressive spastic ataxia with tremor and sensory tract involvement. And so that was why this patient presented at the age she presented at. And this, these two variant types both got missed on exome. So she had all of the right testing done looking for the right genes. The its problem was that the, those tests have a limitation, a limitation of not being able to pick up intronic variants and not being able to pick up um, losses in the chromosome that are around this size. Okay, so the next case that we have is a 23-year-old female. Um, she was born slightly premature. Um, she had suspected ataxic cere uh, cerebral palsy. She has dystonia, stiffness, seizures, developmental delay, um, frequent falls, um, mild dysphagia, fatigue, and dystonia. Um, she had had several prior tests done before they sent the testing to us. She had a dystonia panel. She had a hereditary spastic paraplegia panel. Um, uh, she had tests for Parkinson's syndrome uh, and those came out negative except for a couple of variants of uncertain significance. What we identified in, in this patient was a de novo um, deletion in the DNM1L gene, um, which causes encephalopathy due to defective mitochondrial and peroxisomal fission, or EMP EMPF1. Um, and so this is a mitochondrial epilepsy sy syndrome that's been reported to have fever sensitivity. Um, this is to note a nuclear gene, not a mitochondrial gene, but it does impact mitochondrial function and it does present as a mitochondrial disease for that reason. Okay, so the next case is 60 year old female. Uh, at age 55, she had her left eye deviated inward. Um, she had um, three surgeries to try to correct the strabismus. Uh, she had progressive ophthalmoplegia, severe ptosis, gait ataxia, hyporeflexia of the lower limbs. And when we did the testing, we identified a pathogenic variant that in um, the HSPB1 gene that causes Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, so just a note here that mitochondrial disease is known to occur at any age. Um, the adult presentation of it may be more difficult to diagnose. It can be more varied and subtle and have a narrower spectrum of laboratory findings compared to mitochondrial disease that appears in um, childhood. For CMT2F, its typical onset is between 15 and 25 years, and patients will have symmetrical progressive weakness and atrophy of the lower limb muscles, um, which was result, uh, resulting in the foot drop in the steppage gait and wasting of upper limb muscles. Um, so again, different types of changes. This is another nuclear change that causes a similar a type of mitochondrial um, involvement that has a, a later onset mitochondrial type presentation. The next disorder, um, the next patient is a four-year-old patient with a three-year diagnostic odyssey. Um, she was born normal at birth, um, but she at nine months, she had um, uh, muscle biopsy, uh, mild neurogenic atrophy and type two atrophy, or I should have said before that she had neuropathy, status epilepticus, hypotonia, global developmental delay. And at six months was worked up for um, using uh, in labs with normal lab workup and had a normal MRI. At two years, her she had an abnormal MRI. Um, she They did some testing at that time, comprehensive neuromuscular disorders panel 
where um, there were five variants of uncertain significance reported. Um, she had a normal chromosomal microarray, normal whole exome sequencing, normal mitochondrial panel, normal neuropathy panel. So you can see here, there's the, the diagnostic odyssey was impacted by ordering test after test after test, waiting for that result to come back and ordering another and another and another. And all of that extends the time to diagnosis. So what we found here was, um, uh, pathogenic uh, variants in the TBCK gene, which causes TBCK related intellectual disability syndrome. Here we see we found a sequence variant and one of these structural variants. Again, with our software tools, we can see that the smaller uh, loss of that region of the gene. And then we had a sequence variant that we can identify um, just looking at our sequencing reads. Um, so the um, likely pathogenic variant was maternally inherited. Um, we only tested mom, dad wasn't available for testing. We're assuming that the deletion of that exon 24 was coming for, from dad since this is an autosomal recessive disease, um, but it was not maternally inherited. So it was either de novo or inherited from the father resulting in this disorder. None of which were included or covered or be able to identify this type of change on her prior testing. Okay, so the next test is, um, this next uh, case is a 23-year-old male. He had hypophosphatemic rickets, nystagmus, partial optic atrophy, ataxia, and oculomotor apraxia, and he had atrophic cerebellum on MRI. Um, so what we saw were sequence variants, but they were two different genetic disorders. Now he came to us where they knew he had um, hypophosphatemic rickets due to a pathogenic variant in um, the PHEX gene. Um, we also identified that on our test. It was a de, de novo hemizygous variant in the gene, and that explains the rickets. What wasn't identified in prior testing was that he had two um, compound heterozygous pathogenic variants in the SPG7 gene, which causes spastic paraplegia type 7. Um, I think the important thing to note is that when you do comprehensive testing, if there's more than one thing going on, we will see everything. And, the testing, um, when you order panels, it, it's the testing is for the genes in that panel. So it's very, testing is test specific, whereas broad comprehensive testing is patient specific. What we do is we look at everything and we look at the clinical symptoms of the patient and we align those with the variants that we identify in all the different genes. So comprehensive genome sequencing is a personalized test to the patient symptoms where we don't just by nature rule other things out. We have everything there to look at. So if you order testing for rickets and you need to order it for the spastic paraplegia, you have to order two different tests for that and hope that all the gene relevant genes are on those tests. Um, but with comprehensive testing, we really tailor that to the patient's phenotype and we identify the changes that are related to the clinical symptoms the patient's experiencing. So the SPG7 um, is, char is uh, characterized by the muscle weakness and the stiffness in the legs and that the SPG7 gene mutations or changes um, uh, changes to the amino acids and the protein. When that protein is altered, it can't organize other proteins within the mitochondria to form a needed protease in the mitochondria, which causes a buildup of unusable proteins in nerve cells, which will be caused, uh, cause a um, diminishing function of the mitochondria in the nerve cells, which results in the disease. Um, so, okay, so the next case uh, is a 28-year-old female with a 22-year-old, 22-year diagnostic odyssey. So she has bilateral ophthalmoplegia, facial weakness, left eye ptosis, muscle fatigue, um, myalgia. Um, she's had normal lab workups at 22 years of age. She had a negative mitochondrial test. Um, she's had CTI, CT, MRI, um, EMG imaging tests, and everything was normal. Um, she has had uh, deep cramping, pain from her hips down, and some discoloration of her nails and toes. Um, so what we identified here was um, 
uh, heteroplastic mitochondrial variant that had been previously reported in literature to be present at higher levels in other tissue types. So we saw a very, very low level of heteroplasmy, meaning like a very low percentage of her mitochondrial DNA actually had this change in it. But in the literature, this change has been associated with that very event. Either it's completely absent in the blood or at extremely low levels. And when you look at other tissue types, um, there's a, a higher level of heteroplasmy. So having a test that not only looks at the mitochondrial genome, but also can detect low levels of heteroplasmy can help give you clues as to what is going on from a mitochondrial standpoint. So this is actually a variant that is in the mitochondrial genome that's identified by our test. So the take home message for all of these tests is that um, for a di diagnostic testing of complex disease, you really need comprehensive uh, tests that look for all known variant types. Um, so you, if you wanna identify the causal variant, the variant that causes disease, you need to be able to look at sequence changes, but you also need to be able to identify structural chromosomal level variants, mitochondrial variants, and repeat expansion variants. So I tried to um, demonstrate cases that would detect different variant types in the laboratory. Um, it's extremely important for just to be able to identify the disease, especially if there's more than one disease going on in the patient, and also to shorten that turnaround time and cost of testing. <clears throat> And comprehensive tests are really important for mitochondrial disease because they do present in so many different ways with so many different organ systems and can look like so many different disorders. You really need to utilize the comprehensive test to be able to pick up the, the cause of the disease. Um, just a little bit about the company and what we do. Um, our, the costs of the, our tests are comparable to what you would pay for an exome. Um, there are multiple patient, uh, there are multiple payment plans available. We have a patient financial assistance plan that Dave can talk about. We do institutional billing, insurance building, direct patient pay. And so we work with you for the, the payment part. That shouldn't be a, an issue. Um, the other thing is that um, I hadn't touched on yet, but is important to note is that because we do full genome sequencing, um, we can do the reanalysis of the data at a later date if we didn't uncover the answer. So what happens when you have panels, uh, panel test run, um, is that a lot of times like the literature and the research, it's ongoing. So you'll see that there's a new disease or gene association out there. And when you develop a gene panel, you have a certain number of genes in that panel and that's all you're looking at. And then whenever you would do this, like the next day, another publication would come out with another gene associated with that disease. And so you were always trying to like re create your panels to include more and more genes. That's not an issue with genome sequencing. We sequenced everything. So if a new variant type is associated with the disease, if a new gene is associated with the disease, all we need to do is take the, the data that we already had from the genome sequencing and rerun it through the software. If there's new clinical symptoms in the patient, their health situation changes. If variants that were identified in them were reclassified, all of that, you know, can be reprocessed so that we can see if some of the new information that we have both at the patient level and at the variant level um, uh, actually point to a specific disorder. Doesn't require a new sample or anything. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, uh, uh, testing at Variantix, um, you can go to variantix.com. We have um, our email at info at variantix.com and you can call us at 617-209-2090. Um, I wanna thank everybody for your attention and, uh, and happy to uh, have Dave go over the, the ordering part and then after we can take questions. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> um, wonderful presentation as always. Um, so just uh, to provide a little bit of uh, background that uh, how Variantix does the billing. We're the only company that currently accepts insurance payment for whole genome sequencing. Um, and as far as affordability is concerned, um, a review of all of our uh, samples that came in from January and February found that 
89% of our patients had an out-of-pocket cost of $100 or less. So that's the kind of broad picture um, affordability aspect of whole genome sequencing uh, from Bariatrics. Um, you can obviously reach out directly to uh, to me. Some of you have my contact information. If you need it, you can contact uh, Tyra uh, at MitoAction or anybody at MitoAction, and they can forward on specific billing questions to me. Um, and along with things, Christine, I did want to uh, forward a question that came in to you. Um, the question's from Adam. When, when genomes cover 98% of all DNA with no holes, how come there are still so many results with VUS? Is that because something was identified, but we don't know what it means slash causes yet? And are things different when it comes to mitochondrial DNA? Um, so that's a really good question. So we do end up with, if you don't have a variant identified that's been already researched and published in the literature as being associated with disease, it's hard to know because we have so many different changes, which changes actually would result in disease and which changes don't. And a lot of times the changes are private familial changes that occurred new in that family. So there is no research on the on the actual change. And so what we have to do is we have to say, what type of change is it? Is this type of change typically associated with disease? What's the mechanism of this disease? Is it known? Is it changes that make the protein not be made? Or does it, is it change that makes the protein be more active? Or, you know, what is it in, a, in that gene? What types of changes actually result in disease? And so because we are still accumulating so much information, um, you know, from patients uh, around the world who are having uh, genetic testing, uh, there's a lot of cases where we just don't know if that change is something that would cause disease or if that's just a normal change that doesn't, isn't going to affect anything or isn't going to affect anything severely. And so what we use when we're doing the um, uh, classification of changes that we identify is we use um, something that was um, a kind of an algorithm that was produced by um, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and um, in AMP. And they, those two groups got together and they said, we really need to look at what are the lines of evidence? What's the evidence that we would use to say this change causes disease and this change doesn't cause disease. And so we use the ACMG, we, people typically call it ACMG scoring, to take all the evidence that we have about that variant change and about that gene and see if that evidence is enough to say, yes, that is, this gene is pathogenic. This, this change is pathogenic, this change causes disease. And so when you get test results, they identify variant changes in genes that have diseases that might sort of fit what the clinical presentation of the patient is, but they're uncertain. We, we don't have enough evidence on that particular change to say definitively, yes, that's a change that will cause disease. So they called variants of uncertain significance or VUS, some people call them VUSs. Um, and so we do, you do see those as a result, as a way to say, hey, we saw something, we're not entirely sure what it means, but since new information is being deposited in databases all the time, we can reanalyze this information in six, 12 months, one year, two year, whatever, and, and then see if the new information gives us new evidence and allows us to class classify some of those variants. Wonderful. Next question <clears throat> is, uh, what about uh, coverage for those with Medicare? We do accept Medicare um, at Variantix. So if you have Medicare, you're good to go. Um, the next question for Christine, what percentage of patients with previous negative exome results are found to have a diagnosis with, uh, with whole genome sequencing, I assume he means, or she means. Again, what percentage of patients with previous negative exome are found to have a diagnosis with whole genome? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very interesting question because um, as we switch from using genomes as the first test, and prior to like recently where we're starting to see genomes get used as the first test in diagnostic, uh, in diagnosing patients, prior to that we saw it being used as the last test. So we've tried everything else, let's try a genome and see if we get anything. So from that we were seeing 
um, 16% diagnostic rate from there because um, they already did all the other testing. So we see a disproportionate number of variants that are in these regions that we know lie outside um, uh, outside the normal regions where exomes can find those results. So we're seeing a disproportionate number of repeat expansion diseases, a disproportionate number of patients with pathogenic variants in the intron with single exon deletions or multiple exon deletions. As we um, start seeing this test being utilized as a first line of evidence, we should be seeing like standard um, uh, standard detection rates that you would get from exomes plus, um, say, microarrays plus the 16%, because we're going to say we, we're going to pick up everything an exome can pick up. We're going to pick up everything that an array can pick up. We're going to pick up the repeat expansions that have been missed on all the other tests, you know, so we get that extra, you know, 16%. So it's hard to tell right now where we're at with our diagnostic testing, where that number is going to settle at. In addition, we're constantly trying to find other variant types that are pathogenic in, in genetic testing. And because we do genome testing, we can continue to, to develop tools to identify different types of variants that cause disease. So there's some, um, variants that are very challenging right now that we're working on finding ways to identify those as well. So I, it's not a perfect, easy, simple answer to that question, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Next question, what percentage of diagnoses found through exo, actually found through genome testing can actually be treated versus only having the benefit of diagnosis, which is huge in its own right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that is another really hard question to all great questions, all really hard to answer it's right a now. Great, great, great. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, we have had some cases that have been pretty profound in that um, there were, uh, uh, there was a case in particular that caused dystonia where the child was intubated because the dystonia was so bad, couldn't even eat. Um, and that's how they were feeding um, him in ICU. And we identified pathogenic variant in, in a gene where recent publications had come out um, showing there were some effective treatments for the dystonia that could allow him to have a more normal life and take him out of the hospital, which is pretty profound. I mean, it's one of the cases where I felt like it sticks with me. Um, you know, I don't know how many of these actually have treatments. What I do know is that you can get prognostic information you can get in with support groups that have other patients and families that have, you know, children or family members that have the same disorder and that there is in lots of information that you can get from that as everybody here probably knows. Um, I can't give you an actual number right now. It's changing so quickly. The information is, is um, out there is changing so quickly that it's bound to get better and better over time. Uh, but I don't have a definitive percentage of patients that have a uh, treatable disease. Wonderful. Um, the next question, uh, how can we better educate doctors as to which tests to order so patients can have a better chance of getting correct results and answers? I'll, I'll let you take it first, Christina, and I'll throw oh, it back. I thought that was for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it kind of is. Do you want me yeah. to take it a little more than Well, that? I mean, it, it is hard. It's, compl it's complicated. Um, you know, genome testing uh, and the types of variants and everything, it's really complicated. Understanding the family history, understanding mitochondrial disease and how heteroplasmy affects the presentation of mitochondrial disease, all of that is extremely difficult. Clinicians have a huge job in having to know everything about every disease, and it's pretty impossible. What we try to do with genome testing is to take away that. Um, complexity of genetic testing, say just order comprehensive tests, you'll get the answer if it's there. You don't have to go around and learn all these other method platforms, all these other types of tests. You don't have to be concerned that a gene is not on the test and that gene is the one that is um, causes disease in your patient. I recall a case where um, back in the days when we were just doing single gene tests in a gene panel, big gene panel was 17 genes, you know, that was huge. Uh, we were doing it by Sanger sequencing and we had a case where a gentleman who had this, you know, clinical presentation of Charcot-Marie tooth disease 
Um, they ordered testing on him and there was all kinds of issues with the sample not arriving correctly and having to recollect and everything that could go wrong between payments, billing, sample, all of that went wrong with this patient. And the panel was 16 genes prior to, when he first tried to order, it was 16 gene panel. We added a gene during that year. When he finally resolved all the issues and we got the test results, it was in that last gene we added to the panel. So if everything had worked right for him at the initial, you know, on the onset, he would have had a negative result. Because it took so long and we added a new gene, he was positive for that result. But you see, you, you need a comprehensive test. You can't, you can't, you can't live in the world of adding new genes to panels anymore. You need to look at everything. And so um, the education would be to try to, you know, uh, do as many of these presentations as possible from my end to, to try to educate people as to why a comprehensive test is so, so critical for patient diagnosis. And um, I'll let Dave talk about the, your educational part in, in, in your world. Sure. The, um, the issue, and Christine touched upon this, is that some uh, clinicians are, there's two aspects of it. One, they don't want to be dictated to by their patients on what tests to order. Um, and number two, some are not comfortable with um, a larger test like whole genome. Um, in cases like that, I would always suggest to see if you can get a referral to a geneticist. Geneticists tend to be much more comfortable with the comprehensive style testing that Bariantics does. Um, and then your um, another option, <clears throat> excuse me, is to, to contact me. Um, I can certainly help in uh, communicating the benefits of uh, um, broader based testing for your patient directly with your physician. Um, and you can obviously get my contact information directly from my direction. Um, again, yeah. great question. Ahead, yeah, Christian. one more thing to add to that um, that question is I think part of the problem is there's misinformation about what whole genome sequencing does. Good so point. what what happens is that laboratories that don't perform whole genome sequencing will tell you that um, it, all that does is give you this intronic, intragenic sequence information that's not useful, right? Mm -hmm. And so communicating that, yeah, there's not a lot of information that we know about in regions that are outside of those blue boxes, outside of the coding regions, but that's not the reason we do a whole genome platform. We do a whole genome platform to identify structural variants, repeat expansions, mitochondrial genome variants, and some sequence variants in those regions are actually critical for the diagnosis. So we get it all. It, what happens is that clinicians get told that, oh, whole genome is just 98, you know, 90% of the genome, only 2% is important. The rest is not important. And that's absolutely not true. If you think of it just from a sequencing, that sequence variant perspective, it seems true. But when you really understand that that's not the reason you sequence the rest of the genome, it's to be able to extrapolate this data that's where it becomes important. So what you'd want to ask is, is it important to understand structural variants? Is it important to understand repeat expansions? Is it important to understand, understand the mitochondrial genome? If that answers are yes to that, and they are, then genome sequencing through variantics can give you all those um, results. If not, if, if you want to get them elsewhere, you have to order a bunch of different tests from a bunch of different laboratories, and that gets really difficult for the clinician. Great point. Um, so the last question that we have uh, currently is, uh, and Christine, this is for you, is it, the, is it the only way to detect a mitochondrial disorder to include mitochondrial variant or can mito disease be detected in other variant testing? Um, right. So yeah, that, that's an important and very important question. Very good question. And a lot of times you, when you think about mitochondrial disease, you think about the mitochondria and you think about the DNA that's in the mitochondria, the mitochondrial genome. And you can get this idea that the only thing that causes mitochondrial disease is changes to the mitochondrial genome. But that's not true. Most of the genes that are associated with mitochondria are in the nuclear genome and make proteins and things that will be imported into the mitochondria and affect the mitochondrial processing. So mitochondrial disease, there's over a thousand genes that are not inside the mitochondria that can cause a mitochondrial disease. Um, and then there are other genes that can kind of mimic mitochondrial disease. So you really do need to look at the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome together 
as well as being able to identify all the different variant types to really uh, find the diagnosis for patients with mitochondrial disease, because it is not easy to say that the variant is going to be here. You just can't do it. It's it, the, the disease presents in so many different ways with so many different systems, and you have no idea if it's in the mitochondrial genome or in the nuclear genome. There's no way to tell clinically that a patient is going to be diagnosed positive from a particular test. There's some mitochondrial diseases that are very classically presenting that are coded in the mitochondria that yes, a good clinician that understands mitochondrial disease will be able to say the most likely positive result is going to come from testing the mitochondrial genome. But the vast majority of mitochondrial diseases are not that easy to diagnose and not that easy to choose the most appropriate genetic test. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Kyra, you there? Hi, Dave. This is Stephanie. I'm, okay, I'm on for, for Kyra. Hi. So, wow, this has been a great presentation. Um, I am excited to see how Variantrix is going to change the way our patients are getting uh, diagnosed and hopefully speeding up this odyssey and reduce that, uh, that what, seven year typical uh, wait for people. That's, that's valuable time that could be spent um, putting energy elsewhere other than trying to find a diagnosis. So thank you for, for using everything you have to come up with all of this information. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you too for being such a great support to our community and helping uh, Mito Action bring this valuable information out to the community as it is. It's a question we get asked all the time. What kind of testing do I need? How do I get the testing? So I think this is really important. And it's just amazing to think every day, new variants are being discovered and bringing new answers and more definitive diagnosis to the rare disease world, be it mitochondrial disease or something else that's in, within rare. Um, this is so helpful. As a reminder, today's presentation will be posted on our website for anyone who would like to listen again, share with others, or go back at a later date and listen. You can also find the full catalog of our expert series presentations on Apple Podcast, Google Play, and Spotify on our website, uh, mitoaction.org. And we thank each and every one of you for joining us for today's monthly Mito Expert Series. Have a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to connecting with all of you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, you too.